And we're on the air. Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Code Mentor Office Hours. Um, my name is Mark. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, uh, basically what we do is we invite on uh, technology experts that we're huge fans of to sort of walk us through a concept that's not being you know heavily covered or just something that's confusing a lot of developers. And uh, we you know we've been in the middle of a big JavaScript framework series. We're going to take a little bit of a break from that today to get into um, something that I think is going to be really useful. For for a lot of the entrepreneurs out there, people trying to start ideas, which is technology to help with rapid prototyping. So uh, I'm really excited to uh, keep it a little bit more casual today because the guest today is a close friend of mine, um, Eric Newman. Um, who uh, we actually co-founded a company together uh, a few years back, a company called Decision Desk. Um, it's worth checking out sometime. Basically, runs the application process for a few hundred universities. Um, but Eric was one of the first people to really push on Django in the very, very early days. So um, I'll give Eric a, a brief introduction, and then I'm going to kick it over to him, and and uh, he's going to walk us through uh, a prototyping tool he's used specifically for Django and Python. Um, and again, if this is your first time, basically. Basically, if you're in the room with us, feel free to use the group chat for questions. And then if you're watching the, the live broadcast, there should be a Q&A app that I'll get notifications about if you send a question in there. We'll try to hit as many as we can at the end. But without further ado, um, Eric Newman, as I mentioned, is co-founder of Decision Desk. Also recently created the one-month Python course. Uh, one month is definitely worth checking out if you haven't yet. Um, and today we're going to be focusing on his creation of Carte Blanche, which is a Django permission framework for rapid prototyping. He's also done work for NASA. He advises a lot of virtual reality projects. Super interesting guy. Uh, he's joining us today from New York, and we're going to talk about Carte Blanche. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Eric. Hey everybody, uh, how is it going, Mark? This is it fun, uh, fun little thing talking to you here over this video, even though we're only just a few blocks away from each other. Um, cool. So yeah, so like Mark said, uh, he and I work together on the Decision Desk, and it's actually it's really interesting to sort of start there um, because a lot of what we're going to be talking about today actually has a, has a little bit to do with the history of Decision Desk. Um, it was Decision Desk that inspired me to build the thing that I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. So without further ado, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Hopefully this will work. Um, I am on... Do to do. Boom. Are you guys seeing my screen? Cool. So I am on a Linux computer. Uh, you can tell there's going to be some things that are going to be a little bit different from what everybody is kind of used to, unless they're using Linux. Uh, I'm running Ubuntu 14.10. Uh, Oops. So here it is. Here I am, Eric Newman, Code Mentor, Office Hours. We're going to be talking about the Carte Blanche Permissions Framework. Um, so the first question is, who the heck is this guy? Who am I? Um, and uh, a lot of these pictures that you're going to see in here are, are ones that I've drawn. Some of them are not, but I'll tell you the ones that I haven't. So Mark did a pretty good introducing me, but I figured I'd go through it too. So I was the technical founder at Decision Desk. Um, I was the CTO and ultimately CTO slash VP of products. So what that meant is that I oversaw the building of the product, the design of the product. Um, I worked with it through three iterations, uh, three full, complete rebuild versions. The first two I built almost entirely by myself with help of some contractors. Um, and the third one was really built uh, entirely not by me, architected by me, team led by me, but uh, my team was the one who built it. So I did a lot of technical stuff at Decision Desk. Um, like Mark said, I'm a teacher at one month. Uh, I just completed the one month Python course uh, that launched about a week ago, uh, or two weeks ago, I guess now. Uh, it's pretty cool. There's a lot of people going through it, and I'm getting a lot of amazing feedback. Um, it's been a very interesting experience. Uh, I did write some code for NASA, like uh, seemingly a million years ago now, but I think there is a good chance that a piece of the code that I wrote is still in use in Mission Control, so that's pretty neat. Um, and right now I am completely and ridiculously obsessed with virtual reality and artificial intelligence, so in my very limited free time, that's what I'm working on. Um, and here's a Matrix quote. I don't even see the code anymore. That's how long I've been doing this. Uh, I'm uh, actually 
turning 29 on the 13th, and I've been coding since I am 11 years old. So I've been doing this for a long freaking time. Okay, so that's who I am. Ooh. Oh, yeah, and by the way, if you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter, or you can check out my website. If you don't trust me on those credentials, there's links to all that stuff. Okay, so this part is, I think, the storytelling time part of this. Um, the ghosts of technical debt past. So for this, I actually, I'm going to exit out of my, my thing here and shut down screen sharing because I sort of just want to talk, talk with Mark a little bit about this. Um, so Mark and I founded this company called Decision Desk, and we started it when we were in school. We were still at Case Western, um, and initially it was not the tool that it would become. Initially it was a social network because it was 2008 and that's what all the cool kids were building, so we built one too. Um, but ultimately what it would become is a, uh, what's it called? It would become a tool for people doing auditions remotely to get into music schools and performing arts colleges. Um, and so that was a very dramatic pivot. Uh, but ultimately the, the point in the, at a technical level of that pivot was we switched from being a social network to being something completely different very, very quickly. I basically gutted their social network, and took the media transcoding capabilities out of the inside, and rapidly prototyped a new MVP, which we literally sold and had people coming through the door in less than three months from the day that we decided to pivot. Um, so this was a very, very short timeline. And as a result of that, the very first version was crap. Uh, it was t just you know made of tons and tons of hacks, lots of decisions that I made. I was learning Django on the fly as I was building this thing. I made a lot of terrible decisions. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and because we were moving so quickly, a lot of those things stayed around. Um, some of those things, even after we went and rebuilt the site, didn't go away entirely. Some of those things got copied and pasted into the new site. One part of that was the permissions structure. Um, so, Mark, do you remember uh, how many different levels of permissions we had at Decision Desk? How many different levels of user permissions? Uh, there were many. There were many. There were very many. So um, essentially the way that Decision Desk worked was that we would go out and sell, actually Mark would go out and sell, uh, the, the product. This is still how it works, except Mark and I aren't so tightly involved. Uh, somebody goes out and sells the product to a school. The school gives us their specifications. We convert their specifications into uh, a digital dynamic form. And when I say we, that's a staff member. Then the administrator at the school gets a chance to review it. If it looks good, they publish it. People can then apply. And their applications can get reviewed by the reviewers, by the staff, by the super users, by any of these other people. So lots of different kinds of people, lots of different kinds of access. Uh, initially, the students who were sending in their applications did not even have true user accounts. They logged in using like a tokenized uh, address, essentially, that was generated for them, but they weren't true users in the system. So this complicated things even further. Um, so I'm going to jump back to my slides here. Okay. So what I'm talking about here is the ghosts of technical debt past. Um, essentially what I mean is that there are things that I didn't get an opportunity to fix uh, while I was at Decision Desk that I really always wanted to fix. And one of them was this permission structure. Um, so let's step forward into this a little bit more. So Decision Desk had five different permissions levels. There was the student, there was the reviewer, there was the administrator at the school, the admissions officer, there was the staff, that's the person who was inputting the data into the forms, and then there were super users, which was basically me and my other engineering teams. This ended up producing tons and tons and tons of cruft, um, which is a programmer term for basically junk, ugly stuff. Um, it produced a ton of cruft at all major layers of a Django MVC app. Um, at the model layer, we had to have code which would determine whether or not a user was able to do something that had to do with a particular object. 
At the view layer, we had to determine whether or not we were going to allow somebody to access that view. If we weren't going to allow them to access it, what would they see? Where would they be directed to? Um, what data would be passed down into the template layer? And then at the template layer itself, we had to generate different menus, create different action states, manage a lot of stuff to say, make sure that somebody can't see this on the page if they're at this level of permission, but embed this on the page if they're not. And so basically, all of this stuff that I just said, we had to do for every single different page in our entire expandingly complicated app, um, which eventually grew to have about, I think, 40 or 50 different view pages to it. So it was a very complicated app. Um, this was truly obnoxious to me. So the reason why this problem is existed for me um, was largely because of the traditional model of permissions not really being capable of handling what I wanted. Um, so you can see here I've, I've drawn a picture of a, a very old mechanical computer. It's a, a little bit of an exaggeration of how traditional a model I was trying to replace, but still. So the traditional model for, uh, for permissions, there's a couple of different implementations. So Django has a built-in permission model. And I'm actually going to jump out of my slides here for a second. And we're going to take a look at um, a site that I just built. I literally just built this uh, like yesterday. It just went live. Um, it's a the site for my, my wedding. Um, if it will load here, come on. I built it on a Django platform because I built everything on a Django platform. So you guys can see it's, it's pretty simple, you know, standard wedding app. Uh, but what we want to look at here is we're going to look at the admin panel. So in the admin panel, there are built-in permissions that come with Django. Uh, so actually, let me just flash back to that site for a second. So essentially in this app, each one of these different panels that I've created uh, corresponds to one of these, um, a chapter. right? And I've used some nice stuff, so I can do reordering, and I can go in here and I can look at one of these things, blah, blah, blah normal Django admin stuff. But what you can do in Django is you can look, uh, this is my fiance, Ooh, nobody look at our email addresses. <laughs> um, but you can see down here there's this block of stuff that allows us to set permissions. And so the permissions basically fit into one of two categories. There's group permissions and there's user level permissions. And all of these user level permissions are really what I would call um, object level, right? So I can say, let's look at that chapter object. And so on that chapter object, there's three basic things that come built in with Django. Uh, you can add, change, or delete. You can basically do all of the different CRUD things. But this means, if I do this, and I give all of the permissions to Emily for, uh, for that chapter, that means that she has the ability to, to add change or delete any of the chapters anywhere in this site. So not just the ones that belong to her, but any object that matches that class, any ab object of that category, whether it belongs to our instance of the wedding site or if Mark was using this or if anybody else was using this, by giving her this permission, she's granted the ability to work on every single one of those. Now this is like sort of weird. It's a, it's a thing that really dates back to like very old database administration or uh, even you could think of it as being very closely related to Unix level permissions. Um, this is very computer programmery and it's not really very well mapped to the way that people use their stuff today, use uh, modern web apps today, right? Um, a lot of things that we do are, well, uh, a lot of things that we do are single or sorry, are multi-tenant, right? Almost everything we do right now is in the cloud. So one database, lots and lots and lots of users. Each one of the objects that exists is only accessible to certain ones of those users, right? And the way that customers, uh, I should say customers, not users, the way that customers and product owners think is very simple. They think when they're designing the idea of a, a product, they think, what are the different things? What are the different actions I can take on those things? 
and when and who can take those actions at what time. These are the three basic components of all interaction, of all apps. This is the way that, quote unquote, regular humans think about software. What are the things? What are the actions? Who can do what actions to what things at what time? So basically, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I wanted to build a system that was more closely mapped to that. Um, so I'm going to jump back to my slides here for a second. It's hard talking to all you guys when I can't see you, which is what's going on when I'm, I'm sharing over here. OK, so the traditional model. There's built-in Django permissions, um, which are, like I said, as model-based. And there's also Django Guardian. Uh, Django has some of this stuff built in now. Um, but Django Guardian does it better, I think, still. Um, and Django Guardian is a, is a third-party app that you can stick into Django, and it does group-based permissions. Um, and so it's basically the same idea, except you can create a new model, which is the group information about what users in what group are able to do what things. And so this is a step in the right direction from sort of like model-level permissions but it still doesn't quite get to the level that I want. Um, because, uh, amongst other things, it lacks a single source of truth. Um, so, single source of truth, probably a lot of you guys know what this means, but I'm going to explain it anyway. Um, single source of truth is basically the idea that you should only have data stored in your database one place. If you have to have it stored in your database more than one place, you need to know which one to defer to if they disagree. Um, there's a very old saying, which is my favorite way of thinking about this. Uh, a man who has one watch knows what time it is, uh, but a man who has two watches is never quite sure. Right? So having two sources of truth is very confusing and difficult. Um, having one source is much better. The other reason why I don't like the Django Guardian approach uh, is that it requires extra code. Um, it requires you to add people into a new group object to double store that data where you may already have some of the data that determines your permissions baked into your models. For example, if a flag for a blog post says that it is published, that should be just as easily accessible as you are in this group of information, or sorry, you're in this group of people who can work on this post or something like that. Um, I don't like the fact that you have to go out of your way to code up specific things that, that only apply to this group. You sometimes have to store that data twice, too. Now, that said, Django Guardian is a marvelous piece of code. Uh, if what you need to do is stuff like group-based permissions, very, very heavily, strongly group-based, Django Guardian is great. Very well developed. A lot of people love it. Uh, I have experimented with it, and for a number of things, I could see it's, it's strong applicability. OK, but there are some real-world problems, as represented by this, this. So real-world problems that we ran into, like with Decision Desk, many, many levels of permissions. Um, this gets very complicated if you're doing either of those two things. Model-level permissions doesn't really handle this at all. Um, Group-based permissions, you have to create a group for every different individual model, which means you now have two objects for each permission set. Uh, repeated code is fragile. Um, remember I was talking about how there was all that cruft at the, the top of every one of my views, in every one of my models, in all of our templates? Well, when I started out coding as one person, this wasn't such a problem because I was doing all the work myself and I was following a set of patterns. But as the team grew, this became more and more difficult to maintain. Everybody who implemented permissions at the top and bottom of each view, uh, they ended up doing it slightly different. It gradually morphed, and it ended up being that when we needed to make changes, uh, or, or it, ma it made it very easy for things to break, basically, because it was all very slightly different and dependent on different things. Not good. Uh, also, updating it meant that we had to evaluate business logic inside the view even if we didn't want to. Um, and so this is a big, big, big one. Uh, as our company scaled, we got to have more and more users, um, and we got to have more and more clients, which is what's really more important. And uh, remember I was talking about those real humans, those customers and product owners? 
Well, engineering is governed by the whims of customers and product owners. Um, so if we had, when, when we had all of our permissions logic all up entangled in all of our views, um, it meant that we had to go and change these things a lot when the requirements changed, which as any engineer will tell you is far more often than any rational human could anticipate. Things change a lot. So rather than building with the assumption that this is going to be static and having to, you know, make a big deal about changing things, I, I, have a, I wanted to get towards something that would handle this better. Um, subject to the whims of customers, owners, managers. Uh, and then there's this last issue. Ooh, sorry guys. This last issue is um, engineering conceptual drift. So this is a, a bit more complicated. Um, essentially, Decision Desk was divided into several main departments, right? Uh, we had one department that was engineering, that was predominantly my department. We had one department that was sales, and that was basically Mark's department. Uh, and then we had a sort of a brick and mortar operations department, which was the domain of our CEO, John Knifik. Um, and that included uh, a, a real human in the United States supports team. And the support team, um, very often would be the, the most in contact with our users, with our customers. Um, and so what was interesting is that very rapidly after we built something, the support team would come up with different words and different names for the things that we were using. Um, different ways of describing these flows through the system and then those things would propagate out throughout our customer base and also into... Yeah. Oh. oh, is everything okay? Everything's okay. Sorry, someone else joined. I just muted them. It's okay. Oh, okay. Cool. You guys can still see my screen? Looks good to me. Okay, great. Cool. So, blah, blah, blah. Engineering conceptual drift, right. So, basically, the point is, is that um, the support team came up with these different words and different ways of thinking about the, the things happening inside the system. And we were increasingly pushing for scalability, so we were going into more and more sort of like arcane modeling and, and abstract database things. So what was actually happening inside the system was diverging from the way people thought that what was going inside the system was. Um, and nowhere was this more relevant than at the, at the permission level. Um, educating your users about who can do what at what time in a complicated, you know, very striated permission stack like we had at Decision Desk becomes a burden. Um, and the more different that your code looks from the way that your support team and, and product owners and customers think about it, the more difficult communication becomes. Uh, and this really, really bothered me. So these are all of the my ghosts of technical debt past, right? These are all the things that I, I was thinking about at Decision Desk, but I could never quite prioritize this up the list in order to get to, to really work on them. Because um, the crufty stuff, although it sucked, it didn't ever cause us quite enough pain to dedicate like a whole development cycle to it, which is what we, what we would have needed to do. Enter carte blanche. Um, carte blanche is a French word. It means uh, absolute power. I think it's French. <laughs> it means absolute power, right? Absolute say. Um, and carte also is a double entendre for menu. So that's where my silly naming comes from. Uh, so it's the menuing system of absolute power. Um, so this was how I originally was thinking about this, was more about menuing. Uh, but it, it gradually became clear to me that this was really more about permissions. And I'll explain more about that in a little bit. OK, so what were my philosophies and goals going into this project? Um, I don't know if you guys know, but Python is a very, very philosophical language. Some people would say that Python is a philosophy first and a programming language second. Um, one of the coolest things that you can do, I think, in Python is, is totally silly, but there's this Easter egg built into it where if you open up a Python console and you just type in import space this, T-H-I-S, hit enter, you get a poem uh, that's a list of the philosophies and goals of the people who were developing Python when they set out to develop it in, I think it was 1990. Um, so I like to set for myself a list of philosophies and goals before I, I build a project like this. And so here were my philosophies. 
Single source of truth. We already talked about that. Math titillated thought. This is basically my solution to the, the, the divergence, that, that drift between developers and everybody else. I wanted to make it easy for people to build, rapidly build systems that would map very closely to the way that people think about how they are working on the inside. The customer, the owner, and the coder. Um, updates propagate out for easy changes. So remember I said we are subject to the whims of our customer, owner, and, uh, and client, essentially. Um, my solution to this was, or, or my, my goal to this, for, uh, my goal for a solution to this was to create something that a very small amount of code change would cause the permissions throughout the entire site to be altered. So if you think of, like I was saying, those three things, what are the, what are the models, what are the things, what are the actions, and who can do what, I wanted to be able to change any of those things in one place and make it so that if that object was embedded in a page somewhere or if it was involved in a menu somewhere, that if I change it in one place, all of the relevant menus, all of the relevant embeds would all be updated uh, just with a very small few lines of code. Um, and that obviously relates back to a central Django philosophy, which is dry. Don't repeat yourself should never have to write the same code twice. There's more. Uh, I also wanted to move to having the smallest views possible, uh, essentially because I was warming up to the idea that less code means less things to break. So I came up with this idea of essentially having, rather than um, a, a very small number of views that were all very big and complicated, uh, that had multiple actions possible in them. I wanted to have one view per action. So in the example of that blog post that is accessible by multiple people, um, rather than having one blog post view that has you know, parameters for edit and update and publish and you could push them all into this one view and it parses them all out and figures out what to do with them, you know, I didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to move to having, if we have create and we have update and we have destroy, those should each be a super simple, incredibly easy to, to look at, very, very short view. Um, and the, the next philosophy was that I wanted to extend the MVC, the, the concept of the model, view, and control. Um, hopefully, hold on, I'm going to flash back here so I can see everybody's faces. Hopefully everybody knows what uh, model, view, and control is. Can I, can I poll the group? Do people know what that means? Yay, nay? Cool, cool. Okay, good. Um, cool, I'm going to jump back over here, and I'm not going to be able to see your responses anymore. So I hope they're all in agreement. <laughs> uh, so small as use possible, view per action, extended MVC. Oops. Uh, so yeah, so I wanted to extend the MVC model. Uh, I think MVC works really well. Um, the idea of having these very loosely coupled, very concretely defined domains of certain types of code. So in MVC, you can basically think of it as we have our models, right? And our models are those things. And we have our views. And if we're doing view per action, um, essentially our views are tantamount to those actions. So we have, mo we have things and we have actions. And so the big question was, where does the the rules about who can do what things to what objects at, sorry, who can perform what actions on what things at what time. Where does that go? So I wanted to create a new top level thing in MVC um, to, to do that. I wanted to extend the MVC model with my sort of uh, permissions model. And then again, we wanted to be as close to plain English as possible just because it makes it easier to understand. Okay, hey, Eric? Yeah. Um, we, we usually wait for questions at the end, but someone had a question on that very specific philosophy, so I just wanted, if you don't mind, uh, addressing it. Um, yeah. uh, Robert, who's, who's in the room, just uh, mentioned, you know, that philosophy seems a bit more like Rails. Um, would you find that to be accurate? You know, he's saying that one thing that kind of bugged him about, Py that was one thing that kind of bugged him about Python. He likes how Rails separates things out. Do you know any kind of how, how, the, how the two compare when it comes to the MVC philosophy? 
Well, I have very little experience with Ruby on Rails. I mean, I, I've read about it, and I've worked through their, like, um, essentially, like, Rails 101 tutorial, but it was several years ago. Um, it is true that, that Rails does a really good job with MVC, um, and Django, Django is a little bit more loosey-goosey about it. Uh, I don't think it's really fair to speak about Python on the whole, um, because there are many different frameworks in Python. Um, for example, uh, Flask, which I have not actually used. Um, not because it's not good, but because Django just gets it done for me. Um, Django is definitely... Here, and I'll, I'll pop back here. Uh, Django is definitely a little bit more lax on the separation of MVC than some extremely, extremely rigorous ones. So, for example, the templating language of Django does allow you to do programmatic things. It does allow you to sort of like by proxy make calls back to the database. Um, but remember when I, I was talking earlier about um, that poem that exists in, uh, in Python. Uh, let me go to screen share here again. Okay, I'll jump back here, so this will be less confusing. If you guys can see this, I'm just going to open up IPython, and I'm going to say import this. Okay, so it's a bunch of things here. Beautiful is better than ugly. Explicit is better than implicit. Simple is better than complex. Complex is blah, blah, blah. All of these things come down to here. This one is the relevant piece of information. Part of the core Python philosophy is that practicality beats purity. And so I think that this is what is in play at, in Django with the few decisions that it has made about where to break MVC. There are a few locations where it's very, very practical. Um, yeah, uh, so there's a, there's a few places where it's, it's very practical to violate MVC and doesn't really give you much of the risk or pain that would normally be associated with breaking those rules, so they opted to do it. Um, is, that a, is that a good answer? Robert? Cool. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more about this uh, either at the end or, or offline if you, if you guys would want. Uh, I'm going to jump back to screen share mode. Okay. Cool. So let's talk about what I actually built. Features of, our, of carte blanche are as follows. Um, it has a top-level verb object. So for better or worse, uh, a year and a half ago when I decided to build this, I used the metaphor of verbs and nouns. So basically those things that we were talking about, the things that people can do stuff to are the, the nouns. And the actions are the verbs. Um, and so I basically I created this top-level verb object to encapsulate the, well, actually, a top-level verb and noun object. And the in-memory relationship between them encapsulates the, the rules of who can do what at what time. Dynamically generated menus. So if you're using carte blanche and you have all of your permissions in it, it includes plain English descriptions of what each of the verbs is. So if somebody can publish something, uh, it's called publish something, you know, and that can be pumped directly out into a menu, which you can embed, I think it's three lines of code in a Django template, and no matter what page you're on, it'll always be generating the appropriate menu for the appropriate person, for the appropriate models, and the appropriate actions. Dynamic access to views. The flip side of, of that same menu thing is that if you click on something and permission has changed, or if you navigate directly to a page that you're not supposed to be at, you need to be blocked. Um, you need to be blocked and you need to be informed of why you've been blocked. So carte blanche handles all of that. In the top level verb object, you can basically specify, and I'll show everybody how this works, you can specify um, what the, the denial message is for that particular thing. And you can actually be very, very specific. You can say a different denial message based on, on what kind of violation of the permissions that person is, is having. So it's really, really detailed. Uh, oh, and there you go. Plain English denial messages. 
Um, and this one is really interesting and, and maybe difficult to get your head around, but support for model list actions. So there are some actions that happen inside of a site that don't actually, that aren't actually associated with a particular thing. So for example, logging in. Logging in isn't an action that I perform on my user model. It's an action that happens that applies to the whole site. Logging out uh, would be uh, the same. You know, um, certain things that just aren't associated with a particular object uh, are what I call these model list actions. So I wanted to make sure that it would be able to support these things and have them fit into this uh, architecture that was being designed. And so that is covered. And although right now I have only ever built an adapter for Django because it's what I use just absolutely all the time, um, there is absolutely potential for it to work for non-Django uh, sites. It could be adapted to Flask. It could even be ported to Ruby and used someplace else. Um, like Python, carte blanche is really more of a philosophy than it is uh, a piece of code. It just so happens that I needed to make it a piece of code to make it a thing. Okay, um, so this part of the presentation might be a little bit super detailed, uh, but I just wanted to, to gauge the audience before I either go into this or skip over it. Um, carte blanche is heavily, heavily based on some slightly arcane uh, abilities that Python has that have to do with inheritance, um, specifically that have to do with mix-ins. So I wanted to poll the group. Does anybody here or how many people know what a mix-in is? Um, if the number is low, I'll explain it. If the number is high, I'll just jump in. I, I would assume uh, assume more beginner level, especially because this is going to be watched by a lot of people on a recording, so not just the people in here. OK, cool. Well then, yeah, I'll just jump in and explain it. So going back here. OK, so inheritance is not an idea specific to coding, but it is incredibly, incredibly powerful in coding. So um, the essential concept is that you can have multiple different classes of object. You can have multiple you know, bunchings of, of functionality and data storage that are variously interrelated to each other. So I have picked a, a picture here that is a picture of the animal kingdom um, taxonomy. And so we can see here that like uh, crustaceans are anthropods, but not all anthropods are crustaceans, right? Some of them are, I don't even know how to say this, uh, chelicerates, <laughs> and some of them are labitae, right? And so this is the same way that code works. Um, so for example, in Django, some views are template views, um, but not all views are template views. Some template views are list views, but not all, uh, list, not all template views are list views. So basically the way that this works is when you write a class, you give it a name, and when you want to write something that inherits from that, you essentially put it in whatever your programming language is, it varies, but in, in Python you put it right there inside the, the definition. You say, this thing is one of these. And essentially, in much the same way that subclassifications of animals work, essentially something that is a subclass of something else is exactly the same as that something else except for the specific places where it's different. I know that sounds really silly, but um, you know, like, uh, what's a good example here? Like, uh, a shark is the same as a fish except it's cartilaginous instead of having bone. So this is the same sort of thing. Um, an alligator is the same as any other vertebrate, but it has very specific features. It's scaly. It, it has the long nose. So these are the specific things. These are like the overrides, the important pieces that are different about an alligator than a general vertebrate. Okay. So Python actually takes this a step further. Um, and it allows you, I love this picture, by the way. It, it allows you to do this thing that's called multiple inheritance. And not all languages have support for this, although it is growing in popularity. Um, I think it's one of Python's best features. But basically, the point is that uh, 
rather than having a straight linear and just only linear and branching tree that branches only down, um, Python allows you to have what's more like a, a family tree of, of uh, individuals where any class can have any number of parents and basically the descendant inherits the attributes of the parent uh, in the order in which they are listed. So this picture here shows an example of what it would be like to have um, a class, which is our platypus, that inherits from a beaver and a duck. And specifically, it also shows this platypus is a guitar playing platypus because it inherits from a guitar playing beaver and a keyboard playing duck. And so you can see that it's inherited attributes of both of these things. Um, essentially, it's inherited almost all the attributes of both these things. You know, it's got it's got the uh, it's got the bill, it's got the tail, it's got the guitar shape, it's got the keys, it's got the webbed feet that they both share. So it it basically has all of the main attributes, the important attributes of each of them. Okay. So the next thing is. Uh, fairly Python-specific concept. I, I really haven't seen this utilized as heavily anywhere else. Um, the concept of what's called a mix-in. So a mix-in is a type of a class that is used for multiple inheritance that really only includes uh, a very small number of attributes. So essentially the idea is, like, in this example, we're just blending two things together because uh, platypus is very unique, and beavers are pretty unique, and ducks are pretty unique. But dogs are not that unique. Dogs' attributes are more like a sort of a big grid, or like a, a bunch of check marks, right? And you can say, like, sort of if you were trying to make like a, a dog generating machine <laughs> or something, I know that sounds crazy. Um, you know, if you were trying to write software that included all the different possible kinds of of dog, and you want to be able to create a class for each of these dogs. An easy way to do it in Python would be to create a mix-in that represents each one of the main attributes of all these dogs. So you have one for little dogs. You have one for spots. You have one for uh, the furriness of tails. You have one for a fluffy coat. Um, you know, you ha you basically have uh, a class that includes the specific attributes of each one of these things. And then at the end, when you want actually to produce this Shih Tzu, you would say, okay, um, this Shih Tzu class inherits from uh, a basic dog. It also inherits from Fluffy, and it inherits from Tiny, and it inherits from Mean Tempered. Okay, put all that together, that's our Shih Tzu. So mix-ins is a sort of a, just a, it is an example of multiple inheritance taken to its extreme having lots and lots and lots of, of small classes that you inherit all of them from in order to produce something at the end. So the reason why I'm introducing this to you is because Django relies very heavily on mix-ins and because I was working very closely with Django um, I, I modeled carte blanche after it. Carte blanche also very heavily uses mix-ins. So I think this is my, yeah that's my last slide. So, without further ado, I'm actually going to go and show you guys some code. Uh, how are we doing on time, Mark? Good, good. Yeah, let's definitely jump into some code. And um, you guys, if, if any other questions are coming to mind, feel free to start populating them, and I'll add them to the queue. But uh, we, can, we can definitely get into some code. Uh, about how much time do I have? Um, we have until 3 p.m. Eastern. Oh, okay. I took too yeah. long. Okay, I will do this super quick then. Uh, okay, going back to screen share. Okay, so there are two repositories uh, that are relevant for this. So we will go to my GitHub, github.com slash Newman. That's just me. Um, so there's Python carte blanche, and there's this other thing, the Python, the carte blanche Django starter. Um, so Python carte blanche is the actual framework. Uh, there are instructions here on how to use it. There's an explanation of a lot of the stuff that I've told you guys about. Um, this is very detailed. This is what I would use if you're interested in using carte blanche and you already have a project. You want to add carte blanche to your project. But if you're just getting started and you want to immediately prototype a new product or project with carte blanche, there's this other thing, carte blanche Django starter. 
Um, and it's basically a starter app that already has carte blanche installed in it that you can use to uh, launch yourself. So I'm just going to copy that. I'm going to uh, exit out of this. Yes, I really do. I'm going to create a new console here. Hello. Uh, and I'm going to clone this repo. I'm just doing a git clone on Django starter. OK, cool. I got it. I'm going to move into it. Um, one thing about this might change in the not too distant future. Uh, as you see here, I've nested it very heavily, probably one level too deep. Uh, I think I'm probably going to be shifting this folder up one more. Um, but that's pretty arcane. I'm going to move into this next directory. OK. So now we're in a normal looking Django directory. right? Um, and all of this looks pretty good. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a virtual environment. or the code mentor session that we're doing. Okay, cool, it's installing pip, awesome. Now we're gonna do pip install requirements, install dash r. This is just, whoa. Oh, because I can't spell. Okay, so now it is going and doing the work for us to install all of these different things that this project is dependent on. Let's just take one second. Cool, now I'm going to run a sync DB, which is basically going to set up a temporary database for us. And I'm going to create a super user. Yes, my name is Newman. Yes, my email address is not coolguy at coolguy.com, but that's what I'm using for this. Okay, now I'm going to run that server. Oops, that's not the right one. Okay, so now I have a server running. Just like that, I am running an instance of the carte blanche Django uh, starter. So what you guys should be seeing is I'm looking here at a very basic looking test page that just demonstrates what carte blanche is. So you can see here that um, <clears throat> you can see that there's a join this site button and there's a login button. So, and you can also see here that there's a list of conditions. They're two of the same things showing up. It says, is not authenticated, is not authenticated. Those are both of the permission names for each of these different things. I can't, I, I'm seeing these two because I'm not authenticated. Okay, so I'm going to open up that folder that I just pulled down. Do to do, do carp on Django starter. Okay, I'm gonna shut down this other one. All right, so this all looks very much like a fairly typical Django project. Uh, we have a views page. Sorry, we have a, a views page. We have a URLs page, and we have a models page. Um, so you can see in my models page, I just have this one model here called Sprocket, um, and it has a method on it. Sorry, it has uh, three pieces of information. Um, it has the many-to-many -many field, which includes a list of users. Those people are the sprocketeers. These are essentially the owners of this sprocket. Then it has a title, and then it has a non-database attribute, which is the verb classes. So these are the different verbs that are allowed to be done on a sprocket. You can view the detail, you can update that verb, or you can list all of the sprockets that exist. It also has a method here that's called um, is Sprocketeer, and it's just a really, really basic test to see is a given user a member of our Sprocketeers group. Then the last thing here is a Django standard thing uh, for finding the URL that pertains to this Sprocket. Like if I wanted to see this Sprocket in the site, where would I look? Um, so you can see right here I'm actually using this thing, the detail verb itself, to generate that. Uh, and I will explain more about this in a moment. Okay, so then over here there's a list of views. This is all very normal. The URLs, all very normal. Here's where the magic happens. This is our list of verbs. And really, this is an inheritance tree of all of the different actions and action types that exist within this demo. So let's just take a look through this real quick. 
I have one at the root that's just called core verb. This is uh, a, a protocol that I created to make it so that I didn't have to continuously inform each of my different verbs about what app they were in. And you can see it has this attribute app name. Then there's authenticated verb. Basically the way that our verbs work is they have a name of their condition, they have a piece of information about whether or not it's required, and they have a very, very simple to use function here that is whether or not it is available to a given user. So an authenticated verb is available to a user only if that user is authenticated. So is this uh, available? Well, is user.is authenticated? If that returns true, then this verb will be available for the given user. Not authenticated verb is the exact opposite. Um, if the user is authenticated, we return false. Otherwise, we return true. OK, so here's the one that we're going to look at right now. Site join verb. This is the verb that pertains to this button, join this site. So let me prove that right here. Just change it, save it, refresh it, join this site code mentor people. So my first of all, you can see right away that changing the plain English description of a verb is very, very easy. Um, so I'm going to change that back. But you can see that this is connected to the view called user create. Now if we go in our URLs file and we look at the view, the URL that is connected to user create, we can see that it's at the URL address of users slash create. So if I go here, or actually, let's not do that. So if I click on this button, it takes me directly to users create. So just for the sake of argument, I'm going to copy that. Now I'm not going to create a new user right now because I already have one. So I'm just going to log in. Coolguy at coolguy.com, my password, and I'm logged in. Now, if I navigate back to that view, hopefully this will work. Awesome. So I navigated back to that view for user create. It's telling me, sorry, dude, I'm afraid you can't do that. The reason why is because I have not met the requirements for the verb that is associated with the user create view. That is to say, it is a not authenticated verb, and I am authenticated. So we are getting the denial message. Um, and let's just add a specific denial message right here. So for the not authenticated verb, if I wanted to change this so that it says something more specific than, sorry, dude, I'm afraid you can't do that, which is the generic, I can say, you must not be logged in to create a new account. Save that. Refresh this page. And boom, my denial message has changed. Um, so you can see it's really, really easy to do some of this super simple stuff. OK, so we are logged in. So let's go look at our list of sprockets. Well, our sprocket list is empty because we haven't created any. Let's go and take a look at the verb for sprocket listing. You can see it's very, very simple. Um, it's also an authenticated verb. It's only available if we are logged in. So if I copy this and open an incognito window, I get denied. And the join and login stuff automatically shows up. Notice that when I logged in, those things disappeared from my menu. That's because they're unauthenticated only verbs. They can't be seen if I am authenticated. OK, cool. So let's look at something more interesting than this. Um, we're going to take a look at the sprocketeer verb. So actually, sorry. Let's take a look at sprocket create verb. So sprocket create verb is the verb for creating a new sprocket. It's only available if you are authenticated. And it also has this thing here which says you, you must be logged in. This is, actually, I think I don't need that code anymore. But anyways, we're going to go here. We're going to create a new sprocket. 
So I'm going to call this sprocket code mentor sprocket and create it. So now we're looking at the view for a particular sprocket. So if we want to, we can go and change this sprocket, right? We can change the name to uh, code mentor awesomeness and save it, and it works. Now, if we were not logged in, then we would be denied. Now, what's interesting is the code that generates the new sprocket. Let me show you guys this. The code that generates the new sprocket automatically assigns me to be in the list of sprocketeers because I created it. So I am able to see the update sprocket view. So what we're going to do right now is in an incognito window, I'm going to join the site. Oops. Sorry, guys. I'm going to have to do this manually. Thought I fixed that last night, but I guess not. So what we're going to do is we're just going to create a new user manually over here. OK. So we're going to log in with this new person. Uh, new person doesn't have an email address yet. I'm just manually creating an account. Okay, so I am logged in. You can see that I can list sprockets, but if I go and look at Code Mentor Awesomeness, the only verbs that show up for me are to view this sprocket or list other sprockets. I don't see the verb for updating this sprocket. Well, it's because if we go back and look at this sprocket, fake guy is not one of the sprocketeers of this sprocket. So not only can he not see it in the menu, if he goes to the update URL, I'm sure you guys can guess what's going to happen. You must be one of the sprocket sprocketeers to upload to this post. So you can see it is a very simple framework that accomplishes much. Um, and so basically the only thing that you have to do in order to make all this work is you have to create these very tight little verb classes. On your models, you have to list off which verb classes pertain. And in your views itself, you have to mix in uh, these special things that I have created. I've created these things called the noun view. Um, and you mix that in with for multiple inheritance into the existing Django views, and they sort of like just um, automatically become empowered with all of the stuff that we've been talking about. Um, so unfortunately, I, I spent too much time talking and not enough time, didn't leave enough time for coding, but there's a lot of stuff that can be done in here. Uh, the carte blanche Django starter really does a very good job of showing almost all of the capabilities of the site. Um, it has a, a, an approach of basically just being like, here's an exhaustive list of, of all the things that can be done, and here's the smallest possible example that shows them all off. Uh, so if you're interested in messing around with carte blanche, I would say go and download that. You can start with it. You can change the models to fit your needs and push it up into a new branch or create a new repo and actually use it as you know, the, the starting point for a new app. You can copy code from it. You can be inspired by it. It's all, all available to you. Uh, so I hope that that has been helpful. Um, coming back awesome. there. How do we do, Mark? We that was great. That was great. Thanks so much, man. Um, yeah, we have, we have a couple. We can, I can, we can do just a, about a minute of questions if people have any pressing ones. Otherwise, um, 
Uh, this is one thing that I really, really want to know how to do. Also, yeah, I think people got a lot out of it. So, guys, you know, if you uh, – there was a lot to digest. Um, the convenient thing about Hangouts on the Air is that it's going to be uh, immediately public on the Code Mentor YouTube channel. So I definitely recommend going back, re-watching Eric's walkthrough of all this stuff. Um, does anyone in the room or uh, via the live broadcast have any pressing questions? Otherwise um, – I will send out an email to everyone that RSVP'd with links to Eric's work, a link to the recording, and um, a, a way that you can get in touch with him if you have some more questions. Pressing thing is tutorial on how to install into existing apps. Um, Eric, do you have any, any materials in, in GitHub on how to install it? Yeah, so if you go to the carte blanche uh, page itself, there's a very detailed walkthrough of exactly how to implement this. Um, so this tells you how to add it into an existing uh, an existing site. Uh, it includes a lot of the, the code as well from the Sprocket view and, and talks through how this would apply to an existing site. Um, so hopefully that will get it done for, for you guys. Can you get, maybe give a, a quick just verbal explanation? You know, uh, Shatan was wondering, you know, how do you feel that it really helps prototyping faster? It takes away a lot of the problems that, you, that people don't think about. So it um, doesn't have a built-in login page or sign-up page. Um, so the starter has that right away. The next thing is that people always get really focused on what is specific to their site. And for the most part, that is like, uh, what are the things and what can we do to them? Um, the third part of who can do what at what time uh, is sort of the tedious crap that everybody has to do and doesn't really necessarily want to. But preventing people from doing malicious stuff on your site is you, you, you can't launch even an MVP without doing it. So my goal was at a very high level to make as much of that automatic as possible, to reduce the amount of coding, to prevent malicious action, and to allow people to build complex real-world permissions trees in the tiniest amount of code, the fastest possible, and in a way that it would actually grow and scale with them as their app becomes a real thing. And for something like the the wedding site that you showed, I mean, how long do you think that would have taken you without carte blanche? So the wedding site actually has no permissions in it whatsoever yet. Okay. Um, it, it's totally in progress. Right now, it only has two users in the system, me and my fiance. So we are both in what the security world would call uh, trusted users, right? I don't have to put in any, any rules in place because I can trust that Emily is not going to do something malicious to our own wedding website. Um, but there is a possibility that I'm going to expand it because it, it's working really well and make it so that others can come in and sign up and join and I will be implementing carte blanche at that point to make sure that people can only perform actions on their own content, not on other people's. Um, and to do that without carte blanche would probably take me a day, maybe, maybe two days, because I already know how to do it. But with carte blanche, I could probably do it in less than an hour. Awesome. I think people have to hop off, but it seems like people really enjoyed this and, and are going to check it out. So, again, I'll send out uh, links to everything, guys. Thank you so much for checking it out. Um, like I said, we're in the middle of a big office hour series, so you can you can check out more sessions we have coming up. Check out one month uh, Python course uh, with Eric, and I'll link to that. But uh, without further, without anything else, uh, I'll say good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you find yourself in the world, and thanks so much. Last thing is, because this was so short at the very end, um, I guess I would have done this otherwise, but totally hit me up on Twitter. If you guys have questions, uh, I will try and be as responsive as possible. And that is, I'll post my, my link into the chat right here. Cool. I'll email that out to everyone, too. Cool. Sweet. Thank you guys so much.